स्वयं प्रभा डिजिटल इंडिया एजुकेटेड इंडिया lecture 8 in uh, our series of lectures on uh, cultural studies well uh, the topic for today's lecture is marxism we look at marxism as um, a theory that could explain our cultural uh, practices our cultural arrangements um, you will recall that in the last lecture we were introduced uh, very briefly of course to theory and uh, we learned that theory may be defined as an intellectual activity which enables us to interpret generalize and critique things okay uh, the first theory that we took up was structuralism which we understood as a science of human kind and we learned that the basic approach in structuralism is to discover on or uncover certain basic structures okay uh, be it in language or in culture we also understood that structuralism uh, sees things in a whole system of relations no entity no no word no practice uh, no idea no uh, object or event is seen in isolation uh, within structuralism a uh, meaning for anything is supposed um, in cultural uh, uh, sorry structuralism to emanate from a system of relations uh, we talked about semiology the science of signs and uh, we looked at the work of ferdinand de saussure we learned that the, a word is explained as a sign or it is considered a sign and an important uh, important aspect of uh, saussurean structuralism is that the sign is uh, may be divided into the signifier or the sound image and the signified or the concept and this entire process is known as the process of signification okay meaning emanates owing to this process of signification culture in this sense following uh, the linguistic model is seen as a structured system of signifying practices rules and units are um, uh, uh, rules and units are uh, part of the system and their combination gives rise to meaning we also saw that binary opposites like nature culture like uh, day and night good and evil old uh, old and young are us uh, are the you know the basic very basic structure in the school of structuralism okay it's uh, something very basic and uh, psychologists uh, say that for a child okay the whole um, the whole mechanism so to speak of binary opposites uh, is his first way of categorizing or her first way of categorizing the world or his or her perceptions well today um, we look at another cultural theory and as you know the two most important figures in marxism um, are karl marx and friedrich engels they they they, they collaborated to write what is one of the most famous um, treatises okay the communist manifesto there are many ways of doing cultural studies okay uh, many ways as i said as many ways as there are teachers uh, to teach cultural studies and every teacher would find his or her own methodology or way of teaching uh, the subject i mention that the our basic question in this entire course would be this a very simple question 
this is why do we live the kind of lives that we live all of us live certain kind what is it to live a certain kind of life a certain kind of life would have certain habits which come from certain beliefs and values that we hold to be either good or bad or things that are desirable to be followed or not to be followed right and um, we do live a certain kind of life and not others. So, our basic question to throughout this course would be this and we are trying to find out why we live lives in a certain kind of way. That is, if you believe in God, then why do we do so? If you do not believe in God, for instance, why do we do so? Okay? Well, here Marxism is a cultural theory which seeks to give a historical and materialist explanation for the kind of lives that we live. Okay? It is one way of explaining and telling us why we live, that is, which is our question here, why we live the kind of lives that we live. Now, what are the questions that are addressed by Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels? For instance, one could be this, what gives rise to the clash of conflicting ideas and strivings? Why do people have different ideas? Why do not we have a commonality of ideas? Okay? Why and ideas and strivings, why do we strive for different things? Okay? So, what gives rise to the, these clashes in be, you know, between or among our ideas and strivings? This is one legitimate question addressed by Marxism. Second question and I take this from uh, the Soviet, the great Soviet encyclopedia. What is the sum total of these clashes? in the mass of human societies. Third, what are the objective conditions of production of material life that form the basis of all of man's historical activity? That is, what under what conditions okay, is our material life produced and, uh, and the, the, these conditions are not subjective conditions, these are objective conditions. They are clear cut observable. Okay, um, uh, conditions under which we work. For instance, all of us do labor, no matter at what stage uh, in the whole hier hierarchy of any institution or system. The point is all of us labor, all of us do work. So, uh, in, in doing our, by doing our work, we produce, okay, we produce uh, or reproduce our material life. Okay? The work that we do enables us to live a certain kind of life. Any, at any certain level. Okay? So, what are the conditions that you see this goes absolutely to the root, what are the conditions that um, form the basis of all of our activity, productive activity uh, not just today. Okay? This is a very important point, not just today in contemporary times, since historical times over the years, over the centuries, how has mankind arranged? Okay? arrange his labor, arrange the production of all the material things that we use for instance. And what is, is there a law? Okay? Uh, the best part of, of this, um, uh, you know, this aspect is that uh, we are close to, uh, you know, to the very law of development of these conditions. Okay? I said you have laws in physics, you have laws in chemistry. Okay? So, is it possible? Marxism comes very close uh, and uh, diehard adherents of Marxism would, would say that Marx, Karl Marx gave us a law of development of these conditions. Now, this is a pheno phenomenal thing if you, you know, when particularly when you consider that compared to the physical sciences, compared to the hard sciences, as far as human beings, human behavior, etc., are concerned, you may have principles, you may have theories, but a law is very difficult to have a law like uh, corresponding maybe to the law of gravitation and the law laws of motion, okay, given to us in physics. Okay, so the, uh, one, uh, this is one question: How are societies organized and structured? structured sorry and how do societies develop and change so um, I, I have used the word uh, sorry the term historical materialism here I'll talk about it a while later basically Marxism tries to show us a the structure okay of societies and two 
how these structures change. Okay. Before we move on, we have to place Karl Marx in the whole historical scheme of things. Okay. When he began to develop his theory of, of uh, um, a theory of historical materialism, okay, what was the existing scenario then? Okay, or uh, I could say rather what was um, uh, the philosophy, the kind of philosophy that was prevalent then. Okay. The philosophy that was prevalent then uh, was idealism. Right. Marx found himself in a situation where people, uh, uh, people followed a great philosopher named Hegel, right? named, sorry, named Hegel. Now, idealism uh, says that all, all our actions, all our actions are the result of abstract ideas. Okay. This is opposite what Marx would say later on. This is the reverse of what Marx would say. Uh, idealism holds that these ideas are independent of the material world. Okay. They are not related to matter that ideas exist beforehand and there is what Hegel calls an absolute spirit that guides uh, the universe, guides our actions etcetera. So, ideas are primary and uh, matter is secondary and this world that we live in idealism holds is a simply a reflection of this idea or a set of ideas, a group of ideas. Okay. The, our world is a reflection of this idea. So, what does idealism do? Idealism holds that ideas are supreme. Okay. On the other hand, Marx would say no, it is matter, okay. it is our material lives that direct everything, direct our actions, our thoughts, our beliefs and we shall see how. Marx was um, a member of a group, he was a young Hegelian, saying that he, uh, this is uh, a seeming paradox, Marx would go on to revise uh, Hegel, but he began as a young Hegelian, were, this was a group of uh, scholars, okay. they formed a group or like you form clubs for instance, they formed a group no, uh, known as the young Hegelians. Now, which would mean that Marx agreed with what Hegel, uh, with what Hegel had to say, but no, like many uh, people who um, you know uh, many geniuses, he revised, okay? he revised the theory of Hegel. Now, Hegel forwarded, uh, uh, forwarded uh, you could say a mega theory of how things work right? and this is called the theory of dialectics. Now, I will just read it and explain it uh, 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 you know, immediately. Dialectics is the science of the general laws of motion and development of nature, human society and thought. This is, uh, you, you can see the enormity of this, you know, it, the science of laws of motion and development, particularly of, in, in our, for our case here, for this course here, human society, how does human society move, how does human society develop. Now, uh, the the you know uh, the theory of dialectics okay it deals not only with facts but with facts in their connection it tries to show the connection uh, between or among facts that is the processes okay not only with isolated ideas but it seeks to give us laws not only with the particular but with the general so connections and generalizations these are the two important aspects of dialectics okay now um, look at this uh, more fleshed out definition, a uh, development that seemingly repeats, now this word is important, seemingly repeats the stages already, this is this essentially is dialectics, okay. uh, a development, dialectics as we know is the development, it seeks to find the development in motion uh, and uh, accounting for motion and change. So, uh, a development that seems, that seemingly repeats the stages already passed but it repeats them differently on a higher basis. This is important. History repeats itself all right, but it, repeat, it repeats itself some 
how like you know the DNA spiral for instance, the DNA spiral you see is repeating itself, but there are different stages, this is, this is a higher level than this level, this is a higher level than this level. Okay? So, um, the, the, I am reading it again, a development that seemingly repeats the stages already passed, but repeats them differently on a higher basis. A development so to speak, this is the word in spirals, remember we talked about the DNA spiral, in spirals not in a straight line. And how, what is this development characterized by? This development is characterized, characterized by leaps, catastrophes, revolution, breaks in continuity. That is the movement from one structure to another structure, social movement is in the form of leaps, catastrophes and revolutions. So, things move in dialectics from stage 1, say this is stage 1, right? Uh, it moves from, a st uh, from stage 1 which is which he calls a thesis. A thesis here uh, is, a, you know it is not the thesis that uh, you know we submit for a degree. A thesis here is a certain stage or a certain condition of being. Okay? So, society as is at the moment in say stage 1, right? slowly it moves to its opposite to its antithesis okay and which is stage 2 and finally it reaches a stage of synthesis the importance of synthesis is this is that the thesis leading to the antithesis and the antithesis leading to the thesis, the synthesis is essentially a mixture of the thesis and the antithesis. Okay? One example given, I, um, it is the thesis and the antithesis together. So, the synthesis that, um, uh, that is the stage after the antithesis is, the, is a mixture of the thesis and antithesis in that elements of both the thesis and the antithesis are to be found in the synthesis, but in a newer form. Okay? The thesis is not repeated completely in the synthesis, nor is the antithesis repeated completely in the synthesis. Okay? Parts of the thesis and the ant antithesis okay, um, give rise to the synthesis. And this is how, this is how dialectical movement happens. So, this synthesis that we have here is then what? It is a new thesis, right? Like there was a synthesis before this, uh, uh, this, uh, you know, this, and which is the new thesis for the next movement, right? So, I am quoting from Hegel here. Hegel said, What experience and history teach is this, that nations and governments have never learned anything from history or acted upon any lessons they might have drawn from it. So, here is Hegel telling us that history will repeat itself, okay? history will repeat itself um, in a spiral as thesis, antithesis and synthesis, okay? but will repeat themselves at uh, a higher level and having known this, what stops us from? Uh, drawing lessons from history. You may uh, have heard of the famous uh, proverb that those who, those who deny history or those who ignore history are doomed to repeat it. So, Hegel says that what experience and history teach is that nations and governments repeat the same sort of mistakes and they have never learnt anything from history nor drawn any lessons from it. Well, this is what, look, look at this slide, this is what Frederick um, Engels had to say about Hegel's theory of idealism uh, uh, and dialectical idealism. He says, Hegel's understanding was a colossal miscarriage. It was a colossal miscarriage in the sense that it had the promise like a fetus has a promise, you know, uh, has the promise of, uh, of being born and, and, and growing up into a full fledged human being. Okay? This theory was a huge miscarriage in the sense and we shall see why. Okay? They, uh, Marx and Engels adopted the dialectical part of Hegel's theory, but 
denounce completely the idealist part. So, if Hegel gave them uh, dialectical idealism, they removed idealism, they kept the dialectics part of it and now they are going to replace the idealist school with something else. Okay. Remember what did idealism tell us? Idealism uh, 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 says that the entire, uh, entire universe, uh, the entire universe is, is uh, you know uh, emanates from idea or absolute spirit right? and that idea determines everything, ideas determine everything. Marx and Engels said no and this is a quotation uh, from Marx. Men's ideas are the most direct emanations of their material state. See how they completely reverse this. In idealism, we saw that ideas lead to our material lives. Okay? Here we see our ideas come from matter. So, material state gives rise to ideas and not vice versa as was claimed by Hegel. Okay? So, in this school of thought of Karl Marx and Friedrich Eng Engels called dialectical materialism, see idealism has been removed and it has been replaced by a word by this word materialism. So, in this dialectical materialist school nature or matter is primary, ideas are secondary if not, not being there at all. Okay? in the sense of the, uh, the, the original idea. So, nature or matter is primary in the whole scheme of things as understood by Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels. Therefore, our thoughts and ideas are the reflection of the material world. So, what do we have here? We have Hegelian dialectics plus materialism equals dialectical materialism. Okay. So, Hegelian dialectics and outgoes, outgoes the idealist school, sorry, outgoes the idealist school and in comes the materialist school and this is called dialectical materialism. Okay. Now, if you look at this slide, you will see in the first case, this is our consciousness is, um, uh, our consciousness that is the idealist school, our consciousness determines matter and the materialist school matter determines our consciousness. Okay. Now, we said that uh, Marxism looks at the structure of society and accounts for the change, changes in or the movement of society okay, in the historical process. Now, the question is what leads to a change in social arrangements and these have to be looked at not small social arrangements, but what leads to what he calls the leaps, the catastrophes and revolutions. Okay? Now, we, are come, we have come here to a very important slide, a very important point and I need you to look at this carefully. Marx says that uh, there are two things. Okay? There are forces of production and there are relations of production. Now, forces of production are things uh, like technology for instance, you know, they are, they are um, the driving force of any production process. Now, what production are we talking about here? We are talking about the production of our material lives, okay, in which you and I all of us are involved as laborers. Okay. We give our labor and we produce the various, various aspects of our material lives okay. and these are driven by many things uh, including technology. Now, in these forces of production, um, we because of these forces of production, because of the arrangements, we have something called the relations of production. Okay. Let me give you an example. Say, let us say the feudal times, the times of feudalism, land was the most important factor in the production process and not the factory. The factory comes in with the industrial revolution, okay, largely speaking. In the feudal system, land was the biggest force of production. Okay. Now, related to that, we should then have relations of production. Okay. Without 
us working without human beings working, there can't be any production. Who produces? You and I, all human beings who are involved in the work, process of work, uh, we all contribute to society with our labor. But the relations of production, the relations of production will vary with the forces of production. The sense that coming back to the feudal system, the, in, in feudalism what happens is the relations of production are between basically two sets of people. One is the landowner and the other is the person who, who tills the land, whom we call the tenant or the serf or the vessel. Okay? So, there is a particular kind of social organization. The relations of production are nothing but the social organization and the social organization is between, uh, uh, you know, between the owners of production and the people who are working in that production process. Right? So, socio-cultural, coming back to, uh, uh, to the theory, socio-cultural change happens, now this is the most important part at this stage of our understanding Marxism. Okay? Please look at this slide, socio-cultural change will happen, sorry, will happen when these two things come in conflict. when the forces of production and the relations of production come into conflict. Usually in a stable society, the forces of production which has uh, the set of the relations of production okay, are not in conflict. But a time comes, since you know there is motion, it has, society has to move forward, a time comes when the relations of production and the forces of production do not match. And that is when Karl Marx says, that is when a crisis happens or that is when it is time for a change. Okay? Now, how does this happen? Now, the forces of production, the forces of production are something that uh, are things that are very dynamic. For instance, the forces, uh, the forces of production um, involve innovation, okay? involve new techniques. Right? So, the forces of production reach such a stage that the existing relations of production, okay, they do not or they cannot match the forces of production that drive the production process. Right? And as Karl Marx says, the relations of production act as fetters, they act as fetters or chains on the forces of production and that is when the conflict happens. And socio-cultural change okay, happens whenever this conflict comes about. Now, the forces of production are therefore land, raw materials, tools, machines, knowledge and also people that is the labor of people. All these things go, these are forces that drive any production process. Okay. Uh, now, I will quickly move into uh, um, into what, what is Marx's um, concept of man or conception of man. Okay? We need to first under, understand uh, any philosopher for that matter will have an understanding of what man is, what is it, what is a human being, there is a definition, he, has a, he or she has a certain understanding. Okay? Some may say man is something simply something made of, made of uh, you know the earth. Uh, or clay for instance was a metaphor used at some time. Man many would say is a machine, man some people uh, uh, some uh, would say uh, man is a divine uh, being made in the image of God etc. Okay? So, what uh, was Karl Marx's conception of man and I am reading here man is directly a natural being. So, the first thing man is a natural being, man is an organic being, man is part of nature. Okay? As a natural being and as a living natural being, he is on the one hand endowed with natural vital powers, man has certain powers, certain vital powers, okay? certain abilities okay? and he is an active natural being, man can act, man can produce, man can create. These forces exist in him and as, as I said tendencies and abilities and as instincts. So, first man is what? Man is a natural being and he is endowed, 
he is gifted so to speak with vital powers okay, which enable him to be an active person, uh, a creative person, creative not sim in the sense of you know writing, simply writing poetry or you know uh, uh, doing art or music, creative in the sense of being able to change things, change things that are in front of him that is to change nature. So, these forces exist in him as tendencies and abilities and they are also his instincts. But Marx says, on the other hand, as a natural, corporeal, sensuous, objective being, he is also number two, man is also a suffering being. Okay? So, A, man is a natural being, being, B, he is a suffering being. He is a suffering, conditioned and limited creature like animals and plants. Of course, all of us are limited. The very fact that we are born and we cannot stop the process of aging, we cannot stop the process, we, we, we all of us die, okay? we are limited creatures and in that we are similar to animals and plants. A being which does not have its nature outside itself is not a natural being and plays no part in the system of nature. A being ha that which has no object outside itself is not an objective being. Okay? Suffice it for us here to simply realize this that man is a natural being and a suffering being. Why suffering? Because he is limited, okay? uh, because we human beings are limited beings. Uh, third, Marx also says that uh, it is what distinguishes us from nature, okay? what, what, what eventually separates us from nature is the fact that we labor. Okay, we do work and I come to, we will come to that later on. I will now give you two, uh, two very, very seminal, um, very oft quoted, very uh, oft referred to um, brief passages because they are here the crux of what I am trying to say about Marxism. Okay? Look at, let us look at the first one. Marx says, in the social production which men carry on, now here men of course stands for both men and women, in the social production which men carry on, they enter into definite relations. We in our social production, in the production of our social lives, we enter into definite relations. Now these relations are indispensable, we cannot do without them and independent of their will. Okay? So, in the social production, we will enter into different relations. Okay? For instance, relations of who owns the business in which you are working as, uh, an, employ uh, as an employee, who is your, your employer for instance. We enter into different, different uh, definite relations of social production. There are also other kinds of relations here uh, that are indispensable. We, we as if you are social beings, if you live in groups, we have to enter into different kinds of relations. These are indispensable and independent of their will in the sense that will here could also mean independent of their desires, whether you like it or not. Okay? Whether you like it or uh, you do not like it, you are in the production, social production process and you are in a definite relation with the whole system. Now, these relations of production correspond to a definite stage of development of their material powers of production, okay? now, which is the relations of production that you and I, all of us are in, does not come from a vacuum, it is not that it, it is just there, there are reasons for it being there. Okay? These relations of production will correspond to a certain stage of development of the material powers of production. So, matter here is the cause and not ideas. Okay? Matter is the cause and um, uh, it gives rise to, it will determine so to speak your relation of production and where you stand in the production process. Next, the sum total of these relations of production constitutes the economic structure of society. Okay? That is the total of uh, the relations of production that you and I are in, taken in its totality, what it, what it uh, does is that it, uh, you know, it, it creates or rather it, it is the economic structure of society and it is the real foundation which they call the base. 
okay. This the, the forces of production and the relations of production okay, and the sum total of uh, these give rise to a certain base or here we call a certain foundation on which rise legal and political superstructures and to which correspond definite forms of social consciousness. Look at this very, very carefully. First, we should have a base from which where do our ideas come from? Where does our consciousness, social consciousness come from? Where are, where do our categories, cultural patterns come from? Okay. Do they descend from the heavens? No. Marx says that they do not descend from heavens, they, from the heavens, they do not descend from any ideas, uh, eternal ideas that are there, they come from beneath. They, uh, uh, so, these, these process production processes, the forces and relations of production, they form the, uh, the economic base on which there will be corresponding legal and political superstructure. So, the other word here is the superstructure. Okay. So, whoever, oh, this is very important, whoever has power in the base will organize the relations of production according to their convenience. Okay. And the legal and political things that rise, which are the superstructures on the base, okay, will serve the interests of those who control the base. You follow? So, uh, whenever we talk about morality, whenever we talk about rules and regulations of society, when we talk about legal issues, okay, these are Marx held that these lead to our social consciousness. Okay. Ultimately, it can be boiled down, so to speak, to the economic base. So, what is the most important word here? That economics. Economics determines everything. Okay. And economic, uh, economics, uh, in, uh, you know, to do with what? Economics to do with matter, to the material things and um, the arrangement of our material lives, the arrangement of our labor, etc. Okay. So, I want you to um, look spend some time on this slide, I uh, want you to read it uh, over and over again, so that you can internalize, okay? it soaks into you and you understand the enormity of the profundity of what he is saying. Now, here is another quotation from, uh, from Marx and he says that well the world, um, the, the, this, these social arrangements etc., these are so stark. right? And the, the hapless, hapless person in this whole system, what does he or she do, how does he or she cope? He says, religion is the sigh of the oppressed creature, the heart of a heartless world and the soul of soulless conditions. Okay? It is the opium of the people. Now, many people are startled when they see, you know, see what, see the metaphor used religion is like opium. The point Marx is used, he says, he says in the first place for the oppressed, it is the heart of a heartless world, it is, uh, it is it's, uh, the oppressed uh, person's sigh, it is it's his soul, okay? but it is also the opium of, of the people in the sense that religion creates and uh, you could say uh, um, uh, religion creates a world, a hallucinatory world, if we follow the metaphor of the opi of opium, religion creates a hallucinatory world in which the oppressed feel that the, uh, the situation in which I am in this world would be rectified, okay? rectified in another world. For instance, if, you, if the religious person believes in an afterlife, that there is life after death, and that one goes to either hell or heaven or for that matter one goes on to another form of life or another you know enters the, the body of uh, another person uh, uh, you know uh, gets a new birth for instance. Okay. Marx says that, that these are helpful for them uh, uh, no doubt, okay. they may be the soul of, of such soulless conditions, nevertheless these are not real, these are hallucinations that are there for us and these are like so to speak psychological crutches. Now, you remember Richard Dawkins here okay? and you remember what Dawkins said 
that uh, said about uh, uh, the god beam for instance. Okay. So, it is a similar kind of thing said here. Okay. So, uh, well you will recall that in uh, uh, the two or three lectures before this lecture, what uh, I did was I um, took up certain texts. right? In this case, uh, we are not taking up any text as such. Well, as you know, uh, Marx's famous work Das Kapital in three volumes, these are huge texts which we cannot, you know, uh, uh, at least the at least the capital, we, we cannot use them as text for this lecture. So, what I have done here is instead of a text, I have uh, taken quotations okay, from Karl Marx uh, mostly, uh, maybe a couple, a couple of them from Frederick Engels. Now, uh, with the quotations and I picked out those which I thought could make um, uh, uh, you know good enough representation of their ideas in, a, in order to explain Marxism as a cultural theory. Okay? So, this is the methodology for this um, particular lecture. Now, I am reading um, from Marx, men or as human beings, men make their own history, but they do not make it just as they please. Okay? Now, this is this whole question of uh, whether we have complete free will or everything is determined. Marx says, yes, there is no doubt we make our own history, but the conditions under circumstances under which we make our history are not something that we choose. Okay? So, men make their own history, but they do not make it just as they please. They do not make it uh, under circumstances chosen by themselves, but under and this is very important under circumstances directly found, given, and transmitted from what from the past. Okay, the past is con has has always determined the kind of lives that we that we 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 lead. Remember, even Hegel had said that when why are we not why are we not uh, following the lessons of history? Why are we not rather drawing lessons from history? Okay? Um, Marx says here that we all make our own history all right, but the past is always there. The past is what determines the circumstances of our making history is given by the past. And then the tradition of all the dead generations weighs like a nightmare on the brain of the living. So, there is no doing away with the past, which means that all these social systems that remember the thesis, the synthesis and the antithesis. Okay? So, it moves in this spiral and uh, uh, each uh, stage contains uh, something, you know, is a synthesis of this former thesis and antithesis stages. Okay? So, this is the quotation which I thought was important to bring to you in an in a bit uh, to show you the historical materialist approach. Therefore, Marx says history repeats itself first as tragedy, second as farce. Okay? History repeats all right and when it repeats itself for the first time, well you can, you can say oh, oh, oh it is repeated itself, it is uh, it's tragic because the, tragic why? Because the same mistakes are being made, the same pattern is followed, but he says the second time when it happens then we have to regard it not as tragic, but something comical, okay? because the pattern instantiates itself and we have not drawn lessons from history. So, yes, this is really one of my favorites. Uh, Let us read this first. The mode of production in material life determines the general character of the social, political and intellectual processes of life. If you go by this really you, this is the key so to speak, with which you open the door to understanding the kind of life that you and I lead. The mode of production, now first let us break it up, the mode of, what is a mode of production? A mode of production we could say is a way of production. Okay? A mode of production is a way of pr production the way of producing our material lives. For instance, uh, ancient slavery is a mode of production, feudalism is a mode of production. Every mode of production will have its own forces of production and you recall what is its corresponding term relations of production. Human beings will be in certain social economic relations and relationships um, among themselves and that will be that will follow 
the way of production. So, for instance, if you find yourself, if you go back in time and you find yourself in a feudal setup, then you are uh, very generally speaking, you um, uh, your way of life, hmm, your way of life, your intellectual processes, your, uh, your consciousness, everything for that matter will be determined by that feudal way of life or feudal mode of production. Okay. So, again here again we find that you know here, uh, uh, here is um, uh, a reinstantiation of the same, same thing that production material life and the arrangements of production are form the base okay, you recall it form the base and from the base. Uh, from the base, uh, it gives uh, I know what uh, what uh, what arises are certain legal and political superstructures, which again give you know uh, are is are important for our uh, or for our social consciousness. So our social consciousness depends on the mode of production. Well, so far uh, we have looked only at part of uh, uh, what I wish uh, to bring to you. Uh, the next lecture, which is uh, lecture nine, will um, will be uh, you know will be devoted to the uh, the other points and issues that I want to raise when we talk about Marxism as a cultural theory. For now, uh, what we need to remember are three things: one, the difference between dialectical idealism and dialectical materialism; two, Marxist conception of man. Okay. Uh, three, uh, the, the how society changes that is dialectics and particularly the forces of production and the relations of production. Well, uh, we move on to the discussion and um, well let us see what, the, fir what uh, the first question is. The first question is well if I ask you what is idealism, how would you define idealism? Remember who was the proponent of idealism? Hegel. Okay. And the answer is idealism sees history as a history of thought and it holds that our actions are the result of certain abstract ideas. Hegel even goes on to say that there is something called an absolute spirit okay, which determines our actions. Um, so, I, the ideas that we have are in no way related to the material world. Why? Because our ideas come from those original ideas. Okay? Ideas are not independent of uh, the material, are independent of the material world as far as idealism is concerned. And the very world that you and I inhabit is nothing but a reflection of this idea okay? or set of ideas. We are in, so you know, how what would be the conception of man here? The conception of man according to Hegel is, is nothing but simply man is a reflection of an original idea. Okay, question number 2, what is the difference between the idealist and the materialist approaches to consciousness? The answer is in the idealist school, okay, it is held that consciousness gives rise to matter. And in the materialist school, which uh, of which mat in which matter is paramount, matter or our material lives give rise to consciousness. How, according to Marxism, does socio-cultural change take place? According to Marxism, socio-cultural change changes take place when two things come into conflict. Okay, these two things are. Um, are very seminal to any understanding of Marxist theory. There is no Marxist theory without these two ideas of the forces of production and the relations of production. So, what are the forces of production? Production, land, um, uh, people, our labor, technology, for instance. All these uh, um, things are the driving forces of production, and the relations of production are the social relations. Okay, that we occupy because of the forces of production. Now, a time comes because life is dynamic, history is dynamic. Okay, we move move on in time. We are we are active agents. We are creative beings, and we in, innovate. We 
improvise okay there is the growth of knowledge right so obviously at some point of time the forces of production are so strong that and they, they evolve so quickly that the relations of they, they sort of you know uh, they sort of outgrow the relations of production and if you remember I said Marx uses the metaphor of fetters or chains the relations of production you know they act as if they chain the forces of production, but the forces of production obviously will try to break free of the relations of production okay? and this gives la rise to a crisis which leads to a major change in our social systems. Next what according to Marx characterizes social production and this is uh, the answer from Marx in the social production which men carry on they enter into what definite relations that are indispensable you cannot you have to work after all we are a natural beings b we are suffering beings we are limited but we are three also laboring beings okay we try to change uh, nature and our situation okay by being active laboring beings so in the social production which men carry on we enter into certain relations which we cannot do without, but which are independent of our will whether I desire it or not. I have I occupy a certain uh, stage in a uh, state in the relations of production okay? and they are independent of their will or desire and uh, these relations of production will correspond to a definite stage of development of the material for powers of production. What was our question what according to Marx characterizes social production? Okay. Social production is therefore characterized by definite certain relations, certain definite relations and um, what is the nature of these relations? These relations of, of production will correspond to a certain stage of the material powers of production, okay. a stage higher, a stage lower for instance okay. and they will correspond, will get their nature from them. Right. So, um, I hope I have this is a very difficult task uh, for me and as you know um, there are so many ways in which you can talk about, about Marx, about Marxist cultural theory. Today I have uh, done really the only a minuscule part there are so many things to talk about and uh, I am wondering how to really make them <laughs> into two compact lectures. The next lecture will also be on Marxism some of the things that I had left out and I will also be talking about uh, communism in the sense that um, what Marx sought. Marx believed and I would like to end uh, today's lecture with this Marx says that so far philosophers and thinkers and intellectuals what have they what, what have they been doing? They have simply interpreted the world okay? they have given their own interpretations of what the world is they have their own theories, but he says uh, the point is not to stop at that the point he says but the point is to change it. Okay? So, you have a theory and here the political practice comes political aspect of theory remember we talked about cultural theory theorizing as not just an airy fairy intellectual abstract activity theory is a political practice and nowhere else perhaps you will find this you know uh, coming in of theory and practice of praxis so strongly, uh, but in the person of Karl Marx. Okay? Thank you so much.